Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Morell, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly zoonoses and One Health Updates call on October 6, 2021. Next slide, please. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash Zohu slash 2021 slash October.html. Next slide, please. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Describe two key points from each presentation. Describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics. Identify an implication for animal and human health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats and identify two new resources from CDC partners. Next slide. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash One Health slash Zohu slash Continuing Education. The course access code is One Health 2021. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by November 8th, 2021. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash One Health slash Zohu slash 2021 slash October.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by November 9th, 2023. Next slide. Before we begin today's presentations, Dr. Colin Basler, Deputy Director of the One Health Office, will share some news and updates. Colin, you can begin when you're ready. Thanks, Laura. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on, on today's Zohu call. We appreciate you being here today. Before our presentations, I'd like to share a few One Health COVID-19 updates and highlights from today's Zohu call email newsletter. If you're not yet subscribed, please use the link at the top of the main Zohu call webpage so you can stay informed. CDC's response to the COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve. Please check CDC's website for the latest guidance and resources, including information about keeping people as well as pets and other animals safe and healthy. Hold a regular One Health Partners COVID-19 webinar where we provide news, key updates, guidance and resources for public health officials, animal health officials, veterinarians, industry and academic partners, pet owners and others. Please email onehealth at cdc.gov to receive updates and information on how to join the webinar. Next slide, please. There is no evidence that animals are playing a significant role in spreading COVID-19 to people, but we continue to see animals reported with SARS-CoV-2. In the United States, 244 animals have been reported, including cats, dogs, ferrets, large zoo cats, or sorry, large cats in zoos and sanctuaries, otters, gorillas, white-tailed deer, and mink. <clears throat> 17 mink farms have been affected by SARS-CoV-2. This animal case numbers are available on the USDA APHIS website. Guidance for mink farmers, veterinarians, and many others are available on CDC's website. Next slide. 
Some recent publications of interest include an ongoing outbreak of extensively drug-resistant Campylobacter jejuni infections associated with U.S. pet store puppies from 2016 to 2020, and a novel outbreak-associated food vehicles in the United States. Next slide, please. Additional publications include the Transatlantic Task Force on Antimicrobial Resistance Progress Report to 2016 to 2020, and the October EID Journal, um, which has a theme of zoonotic diseases. Next slide, please. Some new announcements of interest include USDA APHIS has suspended the interstate movement of live swine, swine germoplasm, swine products, and swine byproducts from Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, and the Illinois Department of Public Health is reporting the first human case of rabies in Illinois since 1954. Uh, web resources to note include the CDC Emergency Response Resource, Storm, Flood, and Hurricane Response. Next slide, please. Some upcoming observations and events include the United States Animal Health Association, or US AHA, annual meeting, which is going to be held on October 22nd to 26th, and the National Institute for Animal Agriculture's Antibi annual antibiotic symposium is taking place November 2nd to 4th. And finally, November 3rd is One Health Day. Next slide. And this slide covers some uh, recent outbreaks, and there is a new salmonella outbreak with an unknown food source added to this list. Please visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. Our next call will take place on November 3rd, One Health Day. Uh, please email topic suggestions for future presentations and news from your organizations to zohucall at cdc.gov. We appreciate your help in spreading the word about the Zohu Call by sharing the website link with your colleagues from human, animal, plant, environment, and other relevant health sectors, and letting them know about the live webinars as well as the free CE and video recordings of past webinars. Now I'll turn the call back over to Laura. Thank you. Next slide, please. You may submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or the presenter's name. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You can also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. Next slide. Our first presentation, Investigation of a COVID-19 Outbreak Involving Malayan Tigers and Humans in Tennessee 2020 is by Dr. Heather Grom. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Heather Grom and I'm the EIS officer assigned at the Tennessee Department of Health. And I hope to share with you some of our findings from an investigation of a COVID-19 outbreak that we had in um, October of 2020. Next slide. So as many of you know, our current global pandemic is thought to have originated from an animal reservoir was spread to humans. Unfortunately, only a small number of animals worldwide, including multiple large cat species, can be naturally infected with the virus causing COVID-19. Next slide. Our partners at USDA maintain a list of confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 in animals in the US since the start of the pandemic. So while this is slightly outdated, as of September 13th, there have been testing of over 7,000 animals reported and over 230 confirmed cases shown on this USDA graphic. Tennessee has six confirmed animal cases, three in household cats and three in Malayan tigers from the outbreak I'm gonna share with you today. Next slide. There are currently three Malayan tigers owned by the Tennessee Zoo where this outbreak was identified. Malayan tigers are classified as critically endangered species with a population estimated at 300 in the wild and 50 in North American zoos. Next slide. This outbreak began on October 12th when Tiger One developed clinical signs of dry cough, decreased appetite and lethargy. She was removed from exhibit for three days with the hope this would help her improve. Next slide. 
On the 16th, Tiger II developed similar signs and was also pulled off exhibit. And by the 17th, all three tigers were showing signs of infection. Throughout this time, the standard diagnostic testing for tiger illnesses was returning negative and the cause of their illness was not clear. Next slide. The tigers were sedated to allow for nasal swabs for SARS-CoV-2 testing, which were sent to a local research lab on the 19th. And preliminary testing for SARS-CoV-2 returned positive on the 23rd. Next slide. On the 29th, myself and three members of the local health department went to the zoo to learn more about the tiger illnesses and identify any additional cases. During this time, all three tigers had the original nasal swab specimens sent to the National Veterinary Services Laboratory, where SARS-CoV-2 diagnoses were confirmed. Next slide. So next, I'd like to briefly review some of the methods we used during our investigation. Next slide. In collaboration with the zoo leadership, we conducted an environmental assessment of the tiger habitat, which included visiting all the viewpoints accessible by the visitors and the off exhibit areas where the tigers were housed. We also discussed the use of PPE and cleaning practices with staff who were working with the tigers. Next slide. An epidemiologic investigation was completed on that day as well. We focused on the time frame beginning two weeks prior to the onset of the tiger symptoms, so starting on September 28th, until the date of the investigation on October 29th. We interviewed staff who prepared food or were in close contact with the tigers using a standardized questionnaire. Close contact during our investigation was defined as presence within six feet of any tiger during the observation period for any length of time. And we hope to learn if the staff um, or employees had any COVID-like symptoms, had previously tested positive for COVID-19, or had been a close contact to a human case. Next slide. All the interviewed staff members were asked to undergo PCR testing for COVID-19 on October 30th. The tigers and staff who tested positive had the specimen sent to CDC for sequencing and genomic analysis at the time of the investigation. These were compared phylogenetically with 30 random positive human samples from the surrounding county, which were taken during the two weeks before and after the investigation, and 233 available baseline human samples from Tennessee. Next slide. So next, I'll shift our focus to the results of our investigation. Next slide. The tiger exhibit has several viewpoints, one from the north side, which is shown in the left photo, and one on the south side, shown in the right. In both of these photos, you can see there's protective fencing between animals and humans, which does allow airflow. And there's about six feet between the viewing area and fencing at these viewpoints. Next slide. There's also an exhibit observation tower where people can view the animals from directly above. In this photo, you can see people sitting and standing above the animals, which is about eight to 12 feet. The tigers are known to frequently pace or sleep in the shade below the observation tower, which is uh, shown here. Next slide. We were also able to observe the off exhibit enclosure space where the tigers were isolated after positive SARS-CoV-2 test results. We discussed the infection prevention methods by the staff around the animals, including PPE, which you can see in use here. We learned that cloth masks were being worn by staff prior to tiger illness and eye protection and gowns were not. We also learned that high pressure hosing was used to wash the floor of the enclosure areas while the animals were ill. In the photo on the right, a zookeeper is demonstrating how the tigers are trained, and you can see they have to be about three to four feet from the enclosure for interaction, um, which can last for several minutes. Next slide. 18 zoo staff members were identified and interviewed who had prepared food or were in close contact with the tigers during the time frame of interest. So these included five keepers, five kitchen staff, four veterinary students, three veterinary assistants, and one other staff member. There were two people of the 18 with COVID-19 identified during this time, 
There was one in a tiger keeper and one in a veterinary assistant. Next slide. On the top part of this timeline, I've carried forward some important dates in the tiger illness investigation. So I'll draw your attention to the bottom half of the timeline to discuss the two humans who tested positive for COVID-19. Recall that one of them was a tiger keeper. On the 16th, a household contact of that tiger keeper tested positive. The household contact had a job outside of the zoo and no known zoo contacts. This prompted that tiger keeper to get tested on the 19th, which was negative, to rule out infection, although the keeper was asymptomatic at that point. Next slide. Also on the 19th, recall that the tigers were sedated to allow for nasal swab testing and a veterinary assistant helped with this procedure. This veterinary assistant uh, noted onset of COVID-like symptoms the following day. And on the 21st, the tiger keeper also developed symptoms consistent with COVID-19. Next slide. On the 24th, the veterinary assistant and the tiger keeper tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 by PCR around two weeks after the index tiger shown signs of illness. All 18 interviewed staff had testing completed on the 30th and the tiger keeper tested positive again. So this sample was sent to CDC for sequencing. Next slide. This figure shows whole genome phylogenetic analysis of SARS-CoV-2 sequences with a focus on the specific clade of our tigers and zoo staff. On the x-axis, you see the number of mutations different from the reference sequence. Differences are indicated by lines between dots, which represent individual SARS-CoV-2 sequences. The blue dots are baseline Tennessee sequences, and the green dots are samples from the surrounding county. Next slide. When we take a closer look, we can see that the SARS-CoV-2 sequences were identical for tigers one and two, shown here in yellow vertically, one above the other. These findings support the hypothesis that tiger one was infected from an unknown human source with transmission to tiger two. Tiger three sequence was three SNPs different from tiger one. The most likely scenario for infection is transmission from tiger one or two, which could have occurred as a result of their cohabitation. The SARS-CoV-2 sequence from the tiger keeper shown here in red was three SNPs different from tiger one and two and six SNPs different from tiger three. Next slide. This investigation provided information about SARS-CoV-2 infection in captive tigers and additional evidence for non-human species as potential reservoirs. Our genomic data suggested that tiger to tiger transmission occurred under natural conditions with genetic change occurring in vivo. We also had several hypotheses as to how the humans became ill in this outbreak. First, it's possible that a common source infected both the tigers and the tiger keeper. It's possible that an unidentified asymptomatic zoo staff member may have exposed both at separate times, for example, or that the tiger keeper's household contact exposed that individual separately. And second, we also thought it was possible that the keeper became ill after exposure to the tigers, especially when considering this person's job duties during the time the animals were infectious. Next slide. Following the investigation, we made recommendations which we shared with the zoo. First, we recommended continued staff cell screening for COVID-like symptoms prior to the start of each shift. Staff with suspected or known infection should avoid contact with the animals to avoid transmission. Second, we recommended the zoo continue the use of PPE when working with animals showing signs of illness suspicious for SARS-CoV-2 or those with confirmed infection. And we also recommended considering avoidance of high pressure washing of the animal enclosures if animals are symptomatic or diagnosed with infection to avoid aerosolization of infectious particles. Next slide. This investigation has several limitations. The source of the index tiger exposure remains unknown and we hypothesized potential exposure from an asymptomatic staff member or an ill visitor were possible. 
In addition, we were unable to obtain the nasal swab specimen from the veterinary assistant and their repeat testing was negative. We were also unable to obtain the nasal swab specimen from the household contact to the tiger keeper for sequencing. Without those two viral genomic sequences, we cannot be certain of the transmission route for the humans testing positive during the time frame of interest. And finally, sequencing alone cannot be used to infer the directionality of transmission. Next slide. So in conclusion, this investigation supports a One Health approach as essential to the study of SARS-CoV-2. Coordination between public health officials and the veterinary and zoologic communities remains important if animals are suspected to be infected. We hope the results of this investigation will prompt zoo and wildlife organizations to reevaluate biosecurity and administrative protocols to minimize risk to employees, volunteers, and the public interacting with susceptible species. Next slide. I wanted to acknowledge all of the people who helped with this investigation and the interpretation of the findings, especially my team here at the Tennessee Department of Health, the Tennessee Zoo where this outbreak occurred, and the CDC One Health team. Next slide. And thank you all again, and I'd be happy to take any questions following the presentation. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Our next presentation, Decreased Rates of Infection with Pathogens Transmitted Commonly Through Food During the COVID-19 Pandemic, Foodborne Diseases Active Surveillance Network is by Logan Ray. Please begin when you're ready. Thanks, Laura. Again, uh, like Laura said, my name is Logan Ray, and I'm an epidemiologist with the Foodborne Diseases Active Surveillance Network. And today I'll be sharing with you the results from our recent MMWR publication. Next slide. This report summarizes preliminary 2020 data on eight pathogens spread commonly through food, including changes in incidence compared with 2017 through 2019. It also describes decreased rates of infections from enteric pathogens during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. FoodNet is a collaboration among CDC, the 10 state health departments shown on the map in dark green, USDA, FSIS, and FDA. FoodNet tracks important foodborne illnesses and generates information that provides a foundation for food safety policy and prevention efforts. Next slide. We do this by conducting population-based active surveillance in 15% of the U.S. population for the eight pathogens transmitted commonly through food and pictured here. Next slide. FoodNet's objectives are to determine the burden of foodborne illness, monitor trends and burden over time, attribute burden to specific foods or settings, and to disseminate information and improve public health practice at, and guide the development of interventions. Next slide. We conduct active surveillance for physician-diagnosed pediatric hemolytic uremic syndrome and laboratory-diagnosed enteric infections through a network of approximately 700 laboratories. We've collected data on confirmed infections since 1996 and on culture-independent diagnostic tests or CIDT-positive infections since 2012. We supplement this case data with surveys of clinical laboratories, and FoodNet also conducts a population survey of residents in the FoodNet surveillance area to collect information that can be used to estimate how often people get acute diarrheal illness, how often they seek care for these illnesses, and how often they're exposed to things linked to diarrheal illness. Next slide. Before we jump into the results of the report, I wanted to share with you the, the, uh, a data query shown on this page from our online FoodNet FAST tool showing our population survey. Using this link below, you can select specific types of exposures you're interested in learning more about. These exposures include food consumption, recreational water contact, travel history, and animal contact, which is one that I'm showing here. This survey contains dozens of animal exposures you might be interested in, including dogs, cats, turtles, pigs, and goats. And this example on the slide shows the response to the question, in the past seven days, did you or your child have any contact with a pet who had diarrhea? And the results can include, or the results do include confidence intervals that can be stratified by demographic group and geographic location. Next slide. So getting into the results from our recent MMWR, uh, and this link can take you to that report. Next slide. Before the pandemic, we published our last MMWR on data from 2019 compared to the previous three years, in which we described incidents increasing for Campylobacter, Cyclospora, Aztec, Vibrio, and Yersinia. Incidents of Salmonella serotype typhromerium decreased for another year, suggesting that targeted interventions such as vaccinating chickens and other food animals might be decreasing human infections. 
In 2019, though, incidence did not change for serotype enteritidis, which had been the most common cause of salmonella infection since 2007. And incidence of serotype infantis continued to increase, for which many strains were resistant to antibiotics. Next slide. Now taking a look at the results from 2020. Next slide. There were 26% fewer infections reported in the food net during 2020 compared with the average annual number reported in the previous three years. This was the largest single year variation in incidence during food net's 25 year history. The percentage of infections associated with international travel decreased by 9%. And with fewer infections, the number of hospitalized cases also decreased, but the percentage of infections resulting in hospitalization increased by 2%. With fewer infections, the number of deaths also decreased, but there was no change in the percentage of infections resulting in death. Next slide. This figure shows the number of infections diagnosed by month for 2020, shown as the solid brown line, compared with the average for 2017 through 19, the dashed black line. The number of infections was shown on the y-axis and the month on the x-axis. In March 2020, the United States declared a national emergency in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And following this declaration, state and local officials implemented stay-at-home orders, restaurant closures, school and childcare closures, and other public health interventions to slow the spread of the virus. Federal travel restrictions were also declared. Next slide. This figure now shows the percentage of infections resulting in hospitalization by month. It was higher than the previous three years in most months. A possible explanation is that persons with milder illness might have delayed getting medical care, which could have resulted in them having more severe illness when they sought care. Next slide. This figure again shows percentage of infections on the y-axis, but now shows infections associated with international travel. During 2017 through 19, on average, 14% of infections were associated with international travel. And in 2020, just 5% of infections were associated with international travel. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, there were multiple factors that likely contributed to the decrease in incidence of enteric infections. These included many public health measures, state and local stay-at-home orders, federal travel restrictions, restaurant closures, school and childcare closures, and many other changes to daily life and hygienic behaviors that likely changed exposures to foodborne pathogens. There were changes to healthcare delivery, such as telemedicine, and changes to healthcare seeking behaviors that might have decreased the detection of enteric infections. These and unknown factors likely influenced exposure to pathogens and decreased detection of infections, resulting in a lower incidence of enteric infections. Next slide. This, this slide shows the number of infections by pathogen and rank order. And as typical, Campylobacter and Salmonella had the highest number of infections reported accounting for approximately 75% of total infections. Next slide. In the next two slides, we'll take a look at data from 2020 compared to the previous three years. And the change in incidence was calculated using a negative binomial regression model comparing 2020 to the previous three years. Next slide. Incidence rates decreased for most pathogens during 2020 compared with 2017 through 2019. And the decreases were significant for Campylobacter, Salmonella, Aztec, Shigella, Vibrio, and Listeria. Next slide. The incidence for Yersinia and Cyclospora did not change compared to the previous three years. And previously, these were the two pathogens with the greatest change in incidence. It is possible that pre-pandemic factors that led to the rising incidences of these pathogens in previous years remained during 2020. Next slide. Briefly, I'd like to walk you through the results of our diagnostic test types used at clinical laboratories to detect enteric infections during 2020 versus the previous three years. Next slide. And for some background, poultry independent diagnostic tests called CADTs are being used more every year, especially syndromic panels, which are a type of CADT that tests for many organisms simultaneously. We track the uptake of CADTs through FoodNet's clinical laboratory survey and active surveillance data. CADTs are faster than traditional culture methods because they don't require the isolation of the organism. Instead, they identify organisms from their antigens and DNA. 
They don't, however, provide resistance or subtyping information, but syndromic panels, panels have the ability to identify more than poor organisms. Next slide. Culture is the traditional method for diagnosing enteric diseases and provides isolates that can be used to determine antimicrobial resistance and perform whole genome sequencing. Isolates provide information to detect outbreaks and monitor disease trends, and clinical laboratories typically culture stools for only four bacteria. However, performing a culture or a reflex culture to obtain an isolate after a CIDT positive result can provide information otherwise not known from CIDTs. Next slide. During 2020, 31% of the approximately 18,000 bacterial infections during 2020 were diagnosed only by CIDTs. This compared to the average of the previous three years is only 1% greater. Next slide. And among bacterial pathogens, Yersinia had the largest percentage of infections diagnosed only by CIDTs. Next slide. The percentage of bacterial pathogens, or excuse me, bacterial infections diagnosed using a CIDT was stable in 2020 compared to the previous three years. And this suggests that a change in clinical laboratory testing practices was not a major contributor to the decreased incidence of infections reported in 2020. But the percentage of CIDT positive infections for which a reflex culture was attempted did decrease for Vibrio, Yersinia, Campylobacter, and STEC. Next slide. Next, we'll take a look at salmonella specific trends in 2020 compared to the previous three years. Next slide. This table shows the 2020 incidence rate and percentage change in incidence comparing 2020 to 2017 through 19 for the top seven salmonella serotypes in FoodNet listed here in descending order by incidence. Incidence rates significantly decreased for salmonella enteritidis, Javiana, Tetramerium, and 145-12I minus. Next slide. Incidents for serotypes Newport and Infantis did not change during 2020, suggesting that pre-pandemic factors leading to rising incidences for these serotypes remained. The stable incidences despite the pandemic suggest that they would have increased otherwise. As we've published in previous FoodNet MMWR reports, rising incidences of multidrug resistant salmonella Infantis infections should be closely monitored and are linked to the consumption of chicken. Next slide. And serotype Hadar, which was ranked 41st in 2019, increased to 6th in 2020. And this was a 617% increase compared to the previous three years. Of the 135 outbreak associated Hadar infections reported to FoodNet in 2020, all were from a single multi state outbreak linked to backyard poultry. Historically, Hadar infections have been linked to backyard poultry and the consumption of turkey. Next slide. Next, we'll quickly take a closer look at Aztec. Next slide. And this table shows the percent change in culture-confirmed Aztec in 2020 compared to 2017 through 19. Aztec 0157 significantly decreased by 37%, continuing a trend we've observed for several years. And incidence of Aztec non 0157 also decreased by 43%. Next slide. I'm going to quickly walk through the key points from our report. Next slide. First, incidence of most pathogens decreased during 2020 when compared to 2017 through 19, including Campylobacter, Salmonella, STEC, and Vibrio infections, which had been increasing in previous years. Incidence of Cyclospora and Yersinia infections did not change when compared to the previous three years. Next slide. Second, the incidence of four of the top seven salmonella serotypes decreased during 2020 when compared to 2017 through 19. Serotypes Newport and Infantis did not change, and Hadar was the one serotype to increase. The increase in Hadar was due to exposure to backyard poultry. The stable incidences of Newport and Infantis during 2020 are concerning. The number of outbreaks caused by these serotypes has increased, and there's increasing problems with Newport contamination of beef and multidrug resistant Infantis and in chicken. As stated previously, the stable incidences of these serotypes 
despite the pandemic, suggest that these serotypes would have increased otherwise. Next slide. Third, the percentage of infections initially diagnosed by CADTs versus culture remained stable during 2020, indicating that clinical laboratory testing practices did not significantly contribute to decreases in infections. Though for many pathogens, there was a decrease in reflex culture for specimens positive by CADT. Next slide. And last, the COVID-19 pandemic and corresponding public health response likely influenced exposures to foodborne pathogens. Changes in healthcare delivery, healthcare seeking behaviors, and other unknown factors might have also decreased the detection of enteric infections. Continued surveillance might improve the understanding of how the pandemic affected foodborne illness and might help us identify prevention measures and strategies that target particular pathogens and food. Next slide. These are several links that you might find helpful, the top being the report, the next two being key findings and some resources about the report. And the last is the link to our FoodNet Fast web tool, which you can access to, to um, you look at our data and also go to that POP survey, the population survey link. Next slide. And thank you. I'm happy to answer questions after everyone's done. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our final presentation, Healthcare Utilization and Outcomes Associated with Accidental Poisonous Mushroom Ingestions, is by Dr. Jeremy Gold and Dr. Michael Yeh. Please begin when you're ready. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present at this month's Zohu call. Um, we're going to be talking about poisonous mushrooms. Uh, in particular, we'll be talking about a project that we worked on that examined healthcare utilization and outcomes associated with accidental poisonous mushroom ingestions in the United States. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Jeremy Gold, and I'm a medical officer with the Mycotic Diseases Branch at the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases. And I'm Michael Yeh, a medical officer with the National Center for Environmental Health. Next slide, please. So why did we choose this topic? Um, mushroom, mushroom hunting is an increasingly popular activity. With the stress of devastation, wrought, the stress and devastation that have been wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic, people feel a desire to be connected with nature. Mushroom foraging is one way that some people try to achieve this natural connection, as suggested by this article on the rise of TikTok foragers and an abundance of how-to guides that are available online. Um, people may consume foraged mushrooms for a variety of reasons, including as a delicacy, for a sense of adventure or for psychedelic effects or hallucinatory effects. Um, uh, next slide, please. Unfortunately, accidentally eating poisonous mushrooms can cause serious illness and death. Each year, there are approximately 7,500 mushroom exposures that are reported to poison control and usually around three reported deaths. And this problem is likely underreported, particularly in instances of mild illness. Next slide, please. People are typically exposed to toxic substances in mushrooms by ingestion. Poisoning does not occur from simply handling or smelling mushrooms. There are several common scenarios in which people can be poisoned by mushrooms. These include accidental ingestion, where young children are often exploring their surroundings and frequently put their hands and other objects in their mouths. They may be more likely to taste the mushroom that they find outdoors. People who forage for wild mushrooms to eat may misidentify a poisonous species and mistake it for an edible one. Sometimes people also experiment by eating mushrooms in attempts to achieve an intoxicating effect. And finally, a person with suicidal ideation may eat a poisonous mushroom on purpose for self-harm. Next slide. When foraging for mushrooms, it is very important to distinguish between edible species and poisonous mushrooms that may have a similar appearance. For example, chanterelles are considered choice edible mushrooms, but the poisonous jack-o'-lanterns of the genus Amphilotus can look very similar at first glance. In the springtime, morels are a popular delicacy, but the similar looking false morels in the genus Gyromitra can cause seizures when consumed. Edible parasol mushrooms may be confused for false parasols. Chlorophyllum molybdates, commonly dubbed the vomiter for its gastrointestinal. Some foragers like to eat puffballs and stinkhorn eggs, which have a round shape, but immature poisonous amanita mushrooms may also have a similar shape. 
These are only a few examples of toxic lookalikes that one needs to be aware of when hunting for wild mushrooms. Next slide, please. Mushroom poisonings can cause a wide variety of clinical signs and symptoms. Most cases involve some gastrointestinal distress with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. However, there are some species that can cause potentially life-threatening effects. Those that contain cyclopeptide substances, such as certain aminidas and gallerinas, can cause liver failure. False morels are associated with seizures. Mushrooms that contain muscarin, such as Clitosophy diobata, the so-called sweater, can cause a cholinergic toxidrome similar to organophosphate pesticide poisoning. Inky caps, or Copernopsis atramentaria, may cause a disulfiram-like reaction of flushing, nausea, vomiting, headache, and other discomfort if a person consumes them with alcohol. Some species, such as Amanita muscaria, Amanita pantherina, and psilocybin-containing mushrooms can cause hallucinations and mental status changes. Mushrooms that contain the chemical compounds arelanine and alenic norleucine can cause kidney failure. There are also other mushrooms that can cause muscle breakdown and hemolytic anemia, among other adverse effects. Next slide, please. Ah, so for our analysis, so basically, what did we do? Um, so for our analysis, we asked a pretty simple question. We were interested in looking in the United States at what the frequency of emergency department visits, um, hospitalizations, and severe adverse outcomes um, was that were associated with accidental poisonous mushroom ingestion. Uh, next slide, please. So to get at this question, we turn to two kind of big data sources. And when I say big data sources, I'm really talking in this case about administrative data sets that exist for other purposes besides studying uh, fungal diseases. So these large data sets can be very useful for learning about rare diseases uh, where you might need kind of a huge sample size in order to capture enough events of interest to do any sort of analysis. But on the flip side, these data sets come with a number of limitations. Um, in particular, the data that we used relies on coding by international classification of disease codes, or also um, more commonly known as ICD codes or ICD-10 codes in this case. And these codes, um, and using these data sets, you tend to lack certain granular information that can be helpful. For example, you don't get information on lab test results. And unfortunately, the data don't um, include information about uh, patient deaths. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit more about each uh, data set that we looked at. Um, we used market scan data, um, which are among the largest proprietary collections of patient data that are available for healthcare research. Um, these de-identified data sets include outpatient visits and prescriptions and hospitalizations for commercially insured employees, dependents, and retirees throughout the United States. And we also, um, there's also a market scan Medicaid database, which contains similar information, except um, on patients with Medicaid type insurance, um, which generally indicates patients who have lower uh, incomes or certain medical conditions. And what's really great about market scan data is that you can follow individual patients over time, say to see how many patients who were diagnosed with mushroom poisoning um, developed X condition over Y number of days. So you can, it's helpful for sort of like broad, um, broad studies um, prospectively over time. So next slide, please. Um, we also looked at the healthcare cost and utilization project data sets. Um, these data are great because they're geographically representative of the United States. Um, and they contain data on longitudinal hospital and emergency department care use in the US. Um, but what's challenging about this, these data sets is that they only contain healthcare visit or hospitalization level data rather than person level data. And also these data rely on ICD-10 codes. Next slide, please. So um, we'll keep it kind of, we thought we'd just uh, highlight some of the main um, findings that we had. Uh, but, so this slide, this slide highlights some of the, um, the key points from the analysis, like the take homes. Um, so we found that in the United States, um, there are an estimated approximately 1,300 accidental poisonous mushroom ingestions that were treated in emergency departments during 2016. Um, in the mar and looking at the market scan data from 2016 to 2018, about 9% of patients who sought care for an accidental poisonous mushroom ingestion had a serious outcome. 
And for this analysis, we define serious outcomes as um, including cardiac arrhythmia, renal failure, liver failure, rhabdomyolysis, uh, seizure or respiratory failure that occurred within 72 hours of their diagnosis of ingestion um, with a poisonous, with an accidental ingestion of, from a poisonous mushroom. Um, and we also found that serious outcomes um, were appeared more common in patients who had Medicaid versus commercial insurance. Um, and there were a few more interesting findings on the next slide that I will uh, go over. If you can go to next slide, please. Yeah. So we also found, we noted that children under the age of five uh, tended to have fewer serious adverse events than older people. And this could be for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons that we thought this could be the case is because children, um, when they have um, an exposure to a poisonous mushroom, it's more likely that they are taking kind of small exploratory bites of mushrooms during, out, during outdoor play, whereas adults um, may tend to be eating a larger quantity of, of mushrooms, either as food or to achieve a hallucinatory effect. Um, nonetheless, there have been really serious um, instances of mushroom poisonings in children with pretty devastating consequences. So it, it does happen too, but we saw it was less common in, in these data. Um, and we also found that healthcare use for poisonous mushroom ingestions was more common in the Western region of the United States and during the summer. And we thought that this might reflect regional differences in the popularity of recreational mushroom foraging, or it could be related to, and or it could be related to um, differences in the different species of mushrooms that grow in different parts of the United States. And next slide, please. When managing a case of suspected mushroom poisoning, it is important to take a good history regarding the circumstances of the exposure. Some questions can help identify the type of mushroom ingested and the expected clinical effects. For example, it may help to find out why a patient ate a mushroom. A forager who picked mushrooms to eat may have consumed a large amount as part of a meal, while as uh, Jeremy mentioned, a young child who's exploring in the backyard may have had just a little taste. With foragers, it often helps to ask what kind of mushroom they thought they found. This can point to commonly misidentified toxic lookalikes. It might also be useful to ask how the mushrooms were prepared. Even edible species that are undercooked or not fresh may cause gastrointestinal upset. Sometimes knowing where a mushroom was found can also help with identification. Was it growing in the grass, for example, or in the woods? Was it growing on dirt, wood, a live tree, or other organic material? Also, knowing the time of ingestion and when symptoms started can provide useful clues. Delayed onset of GI symptoms more than five or six hours after ingestion is especially concerning for poisoning from cyclopeptide containing mushrooms that can cause liver failure. Next slide, please. Whenever it's possible, find and save any remaining uneaten specimens for identification. Advise the patient to bring any specimens to the hospital and also try to take good quality photographs. It's important to not just snap a quick picture from the top, but to get multiple angles that show all parts of the mushroom, including the cap, the underside of the cap where the gills may be found, the stalk and other features. Sometimes spore prints may help with identification, although they take time to perform and might not always be useful in acute clinical care. To take a spore print, lay the cap of a mushroom on a sheet of paper and allow it to sit undisturbed for several hours or overnight. For example, edible honey mushrooms have white spores while their toxic lookalikes, the deadly gallerinas, have dark brown spores. Edible parasol mushrooms have white spores too, but poisonous false parasols have grayish green spores. All of this information may be useful to specialists at the Poison Control Center to provide further guidance. Next slide. Although serious adverse events were pretty rare based on our study, the morbidity and mortality from mushroom poisonings can be quite serious, as most mushroom poisonings are preventable. Our findings underscore the importance of increased public health messaging on this topic. The public needs to be aware that poisonous mushrooms can resemble non-poisonous mushrooms. Cooking mushrooms does not remove or inactivate toxins and wild mushrooms should never be consumed unless they are identified by an expert. Further public health interventions tailored to specific community needs may be warranted as well. These may include educational messaging in different languages, identifying any local practices that may increase risk 
and raising awareness of common poisonous species in the area. Next slide. In cases of suspected mushroom poisoning, it is important to seek medical attention immediately for any symptoms following ingestion. Do not delay medical care by using unproven home remedies. Your local poison control center can be a good resource for advice regarding clinical management and any interventions that may be needed. This service is available to the public 24 hours a day. To reach poison control, call 1-800-222-1222. Next slide, please. Well, thank you all very much for listening and we will be happy to take any questions. Thank you both. Um, and thanks to all of today's speakers for your informative presentations. Next slide, please. So links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2021 slash october.html. We have time for a few questions. Um, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your questions and please include the presenter's name or topic. So we'll start with a couple of questions for Dr. Grome. Is there a way to do wastewater surveillance at the zoo in order to recognize transmission prior to outbreaks as is done in human sewage studies? Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, we didn't specifically look into how um, wastewater or sewage was managed during our investigation, so I'm not sure if it's a completely separate system from the human wastewater system overall or how it's engineered at the zoo. Um, and this was also a a very large zoo. So there was numerous exhibits and numerous species. So I think it would be a kind of unique technical setup to try and implement, but it's an interesting idea for how to use that surveillance approach. And we didn't really talk about it before. So um, I appreciate the idea. Great, thank you. And there was an additional question for you asking about the outcome for the tigers. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, Fortunately, all, the th all three of the tigers recovered without any persistent symptoms, and then there were no more cases um, in any of the animals or humans uh, beyond that which I discussed in the presentation. Thank you. We have a question for Dr. Gold and Ye. Um, what was the type of mushroom reported consistently in medical records um, to further understand hypotheses for why people are ingesting uh, that mushroom? Sure, uh, I, I can take that question. Um, I that this is unfortunately one of the limitations with the um, with the data sets we use. We we only had like the ICD code, so it would be you know accidental mushroom poisoning or which is what we looked at. But we also explored sort of like um, um, there were other op there were other options available to like um, for self like did the patient um, ingest the mushroom for self harm or intentional injury, which was which is very uncommon. Um, we were able to get some sense, like looking at, um, based on the symptoms, um, sort of hints at why the patient might've been ingesting the uh, poisonous mushrooms. For example, like the neurologic behavioral symptoms were much more common in adults. And we kind of suspect that that's related to, um, maybe adults are probably more likely to be trying these mushrooms as a hallucinatory, um, for hallucinatory effect. But yeah, we don't have details on the specific um, pathogens. Um, and we have a question for Logan. Did the rates of hemolytic uremic syndrome change during the pandemic period? Thank you for the question. Um, so FoodNet surveillance for hemolytic uremic syndrome is actually a two-year surveillance period versus a one-year surveillance period for our pathogen infections. So we actually have not reported out the infections for 2020 for HUS. Um, those will be reported in our uh, publication next year. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, and then we have a question that uh, maybe for both our foodborne and mushroom presenters, how do the changes in foodborne pathogens and mushroom poisoning reflect any reported data in types of food eaten and sources like home delivery versus eating out or changes in supply chain chains? I can uh, take a shot at the foodborne side of things. Um, so we didn't take into account specific factors related to the pandemic um, because we, don't, we didn't have those data available. Um, we do know that assessing how specific factors for, for seeing how the pandemic affected our specific pathogens is difficult. Um, what we do know and what we can say is that the dramatic declines that we saw in 2020 are unlikely to persist. And our uh, case rates during 2020 with preliminary data show that our incidence of some infections are returning to pre-pandemic levels. 
And, and from, um, oh, sure. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Yeah, from the, from the mushroom side, um, we, we unfortunately just didn't have that level of detail, but it's very interesting, like in a future study to explore those questions. But yeah, we were pretty limited in what we could ascertain. And a follow-up question for Dr. Skoldenye. Do you have any ideas or theories of why people covered by Medicaid um, more commonly experience mushroom poisoning? Sure. Um, we, we thought about that question. Um, one thing that we were able to find just kind of from reviewing the literature is that patients with Medicaid do tend to be less, um, they have more, more less likely to use poison control or to be aware of the resources to call poison control. So we thought that could potentially um, be a reason why um, there could be delays in seeking appropriate care, which could lead to worse outcomes. But it's kind of, we were just kind of speculating. We don't really know for sure um, why we saw that observation. Thank you. Um, and then we did have a question again for Dr. Groom. Was the variant um, that caused COVID-19 in the tigers and people identified? Yes, so this was uh, from lineage B12. So it wasn't a familiar name lineage. Um, it was the most common um, in Tennessee and the surrounding county at that time, but not one that's um, kind of circulating commonly within 2021. Um, and another question for Drs. Gold and Yeh, what is the best way to preserve mushrooms for testing after taking photos? Is freezing okay? Uh, yes, this is Michael. I can take a shot at that. Um, unfortunately, for the most part, mushrooms really don't last too long if you uh, leave them out. Um, so usually we uh, would try to get good quality photographs as soon as possible and maybe a spore print for identification. Um, you may try drawing the sample, but again, usually uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, in the poison center, we often uh, do not do any testing on the mushroom. We rely on the gross appearance and description or identification. Thanks. And another question for Dr. Grome. Um, did the caretakers for the tiger care for any other SARS-CoV-2 susceptible species? Yes, they did. Um, I would, I'm working under the kind of assumption that uh, presuming all species were susceptible, um, but none of the other animals that that caretaker worked with tested positive um, or showed clinical signs of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Thank you. And we have time for one more question for Logan um, with vegetable um, transmitted staccory coli or salmonella. Reports usually don't mention the geographical source. Is that important to identify? So our data in FoodNet do not have uh, what source of the infection, what what the source attributed to the infection. We know what the infections are. We we know that there are human infections. For example, we know the demographics, and we know certain exposures, but we don't attribute those to specific uh, exposures. Uh, I believe you're referring to more like an outbreak investigation, and I would have to defer to those folks in the outbreaks. Group. Great, thank you. Um, if you have other questions for today's presenters, we've included their email addresses on this slide on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar and in today's email newsletter. A video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days as well. Next slide. And please join us for the next Zohu Call on November 3rd, 2021, which is One Health Day. Thank you for your participation. This ends today's webinar.